My name is Lisa Favron and I was born and raised in the Yukon. I've been living here in Dawson City since 1992. There's quite a bit of family history. My great-grandfather came over from Finland on a boat when he heard about the gold rush and they hiked the Chilkoot Pass and settled in the confluence of the Bonanza Creek and El Dorado Creek. When my great-grandfather was mining, all of the mining was done by hand. Um, any dirt that you moved was moved with a pail and a shovel. If you had to dig a trench, you dug it by hand. My name is Neil Loveless. I'm originally from the Yukon. I've got family that's been here for over 100 years. Mining over the past 100 years has adapted and changed lots. It started as hand shafts and guys panning for gold on big adventurous hopes that they're going to find lots at the bottom of deep holes. Then it changed over time as uh, the gold became harder to find. They went towards dredges, which were the bigger, larger, more industrial setups. The dredge was a very interesting machine as it runs off water and gravity and it's still very similar to the machines we use today. Joe Boyle and the guys of the old, they would have been amazing thinkers and great big schemers as what it took to get these dredges here. The thought of even doing that today, let alone with the roads and the infrastructure we have now, it's still a mind-boggling feat that they were able to do that. Historically, the mining done by the dredges was simply to go in and turn the creek upside down. They knew that the gold was on the bedrock at the bottom of the creek, so how do you get that? Is you dig out the bottom and put it on top. My grandfather was dredge master for years. He had stories for all of the fingers on his hands because he broke every finger he had at a different time. He had a shovel finger and a trommel finger. I think I've got more memories of the dredge than any other part of placer mining in the, in the Yukon. And the fact that so much effort is being put into the preservation and the restoration of these historic sites uh, makes me want to be a part of that too. It makes me proud um, to be, have that heritage behind me and to be a part of it. I'm Jesse Cook, and I'm from Windsor, Ontario. When the Stampeders arrived in Dawson, I, I don't think they had any idea what to expect. I think my generation of people were coming here for the adventure, also not knowing what to expect once they got here, and that was definitely the case for myself. The guys that I most admire, uh, well, there's, there's lots of them from the Gold Rush. Joe Ledoux is a, a great example of an entrepreneur. I mean, he was the first one in that all the Stampeders were rushing off to Bonanza Creek to stake claims. And uh, here's this guy staking up a swamp uh, with the idea of turning it into a town site. And he subdivided town lots and sold them off and made his fortune that way. Not only making money, but responding to a serious need, which was where we're going to put all these people. I'm Jim William, and I'm from Southern California, and I'm a carpenter here in Dawson City. Parks Canada approached me and they were in the process of restoring the Kino and they wanted somebody that had some experience. A lot of the carpentry and stuff I found to be as light as possible. Everything was scaled for weight. All the structural members would be fur, but it would be scaled down to just a minimum size. These boats were primarily trucks. The primary thing was freight. When you go to the Kino now, you'll see that there are some rooms available, but the, the main floor is really just freight. Because of the gold fields and the constant need for materials out there, the shipping and freighting business was pretty organized early on. And it was just a constant flow of materials during the summertime on those riverboats. And if you look at old photographs of Dawson, you can just see the docks are full of boats. The one that we came across was a deck. A My deck. name is Georgette McLeod. I'm from Dawson City. Before the gold rush, uh, the Trondek uh, lived in this area here and along the Klondike River, and then they lived further down along the Yukon River in various locations. 
They spent most of their time during the summer months fishing for salmon. The salmon that ran through this area during that time period was like gold to them. When the gold rush started, the Trondequichin had to change their way of life. They switched from a traditional economy of trade and moved into a wage economy to be able to live the lifestyle that had changed. They weren't self-sustaining in a way anymore. <laughs> from the time of the gold rush to now, I think things have improved substantially, even though there's a large part of our history and our culture and knowledge has been lost. There are great efforts to try and bring the language and the culture back. You could tell in the architecture that this was a frontier gold rush town. I mean, there was the gaudiness of all the architectural details, the, the moldings and all that kind of stuff in the buildings, but at the same time, there was this kind of civilizing footprint on this wild wilderness that was here. Thomas Fuller was a government architect sent up here, I think it was about 1902 or somewhere around there. He was the designer of some of the major government buildings in the town. The post office being my favorite of the Fuller buildings, you're overwhelmed by the detail of the woodwork that's inside the wickets and where you you know where you've got your post office boxes and all that kind of stuff it's just the, the work is marvelous really I started copying and imitating some of his combinations of moldings and different angles that he would use to accomplish what he was trying to do my name is Maria Sol Suarez Martinez I'm from Argentina originally. I went to design school and then I specialized in millinery and uh, I ended up here and contrary to what everybody would think, I actually found employment making hats in a tiny town of 2,000 people. Okay, so how does it feel? It's perfect. At some point yeah. uh, in Gold Rush uh, era, Dawson City was called the Paris of the North. Even there were mud streets, people had beautiful clothes and beautiful shoes and hats. And I guess it was a real need for luxury because some people were making money and uh, you're in the middle of nowhere, so where do you spend it? If I was to relate to somebody from the Gold Rush, a historical figure, it would be Madame Tremblay. She had the vision to open a shop for all the ladies that ended up here. She imported things from Paris, really beautiful, delicate things. I see myself kind of reflected in that, just trying to make a little bit of room for myself and what I like and in my trade, I guess. Even if we're in the middle of nowhere uh, and there's a lot of things that make life a lot different from a city, there's still certain luxuries that we can have. And uh, even if it seems a little bit weird, we can, we can make room for it, we can make it happen. Well, my name is Alain de Rapensigny. I was born in Montreal, come up here in 1981. I, I'd never seen a picture of Dawson. I come to the Yukon with no, without knowing at all anything about the Yukon. I didn't know about the gold rush. Well, the job I would do was probably better with a paintbrush and with a hammer, so I ended up doing sign painting. I did the Red Feather Saloon, not just the, the whole corner, the whole new building there. There was quite a few signs there. And what I discovered when I did the Red Feather Saloon, they would do most of the sign painting inside a shop and on paper. And then they would send the labor to put that paper on the wall. And with a little wheel, a little teeth in it, they would just make all, all through the letter. And then with a little pouch of chalk, they would copy that, that pattern and the labor would paint the thing. And when I did the Red Feather Saloon, I could see in the old board, those a little hole that was left there. And I said, this is so ironic. A like, hundred days later, I'm the labor now doing that. Well, I did the Grand Palace, I did the mural. Dawson is a lot of, lot of energy in this town. I think the energy remained, some, something that stay in the air from the gold rush. I mean, you look at 40,000 people, he must have been a hell of a party here. And that's still, he still can feel it. I think he still can feel it. After that many years here, I probably can paint any corner of this town for memory, character included. <laughs>
I've never been really good at putting my thoughts and feelings into words and sometimes when I read uh, Jack London or Robert Service, I mean their words are my feelings and I didn't even know I had them until I heard the words and then it all makes sense. So when you read Robert Service, when I read Robert Service, the subject matter was sort of gold rush wild, but the way he wrote it was more civilized, you know, so you got this kind of contrast between what he was writing about and how he wrote it. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see it was the night on the marge of Lake LaBarge I cremated Sam McGee. People used to read this stuff aloud in the family because they didn't have radios and television. So, you know, the dad would read a poem in the evening or several poems in the evening. This was common. And I think that's one reason why he wrote the poems like he did in that kind of uh, doggerel style, you know, that it's not very complicated, it's not very esoteric, it's sort of entertaining kind of a song, you know. Our elders are our history and our university. They're the holders of the knowledge of the land, and it's important to take it in and share it with others. Now that people my age and younger are getting educated about their history, I think it's helping them reach back into their culture. It's important for me to raise my family in a setting like in Dawson and along the Yukon River. It brings out the best in them in exploring their own land. We can talk about things that uh, I've done as a child. Uh, I could talk about my family and, uh, and I can share those stories with them and have those experiences with them when we have a chance to be at places such as this. The, the historic nature of this town is a big part of everybody's life here. What I like about it is it's a real life town. It's not just a, a ghost town. It's not uh, just a museum with, with a facade. It's, these buildings are lived in, these old cowboy buildings that you see, they're, they're lived in and there's real businesses and real people in them. And uh, that's a lot of fun and that, that plays, that's a huge part of our culture here. And that's a huge part of the reason I love it here. I think everybody feels uh, very proud of the heritage, even people like me who just came here a few years ago rather than um, was born here. But everybody feels pretty proud of their town uh, and it's not hard to love it very quickly. What I like in the summertime is watching the people walk all over the place, walk in the middle of the street, on the sidewalks and stuff like that. And it really makes me feel like all of a sudden I'm back in that gold rush time because if you look at the old photographs, there's just people everywhere in the middle of the streets and um, Dawson gets like that. It, it really gives you that sensation that you're, you've stepped back in time in a way. And, and with the old buildings, it uh, just adds perfect backdrop for all that.